y'all will turn to in your Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 18. We're going to start in verse 30. Very familiar story about Elijah. We're going to kind of hit some of the highlights, Lord willing, as we go through here. Um, we're going to read a few verses here and then go on into verse chapter 19. First Kings chapter 18, beginning in verse 30, says, And Elijah said unto all the people, Come near unto me. And all the people came near unto him. And he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. And Elijah took twelve stones, according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, unto whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be thy name. And with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, he made a trench about the altar as great as could contain two measures of seed, put the wood in order, and cut the bullock in pieces, and laid him on the wood, <clears throat> and said, Fill four barrels with water, and pour it on the burnt sacrifice and on the wood. And he said, Do it a second time, and they did it a second time. And he said, Do it a third time, and they did it the third time. The water ran round about the altar, and filled the trench also with water. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in heaven. I'm sorry, that thou art God in Israel, and that I am thy servant, that I have done all these things at thy word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God, that thou hast turned their heart back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering and consumed the burnt sacrifice on the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is the God. Let's pray. Father, as we look at your word, I pray that we might see it afresh and anew, that we might understand it. And Lord, would you speak to us from it, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I was <clears throat> thinking about this in terms of missions. Um, in missions... Or at least, uh, I'm, I guess I'm thinking of foreign missions. A lot of times we go to a place that is considered foreign. It's considered um, very much removed from God and his testimony. Um, it is... Uh, heathen, you know, uh, a, a very common term there, and they have um, ways of worshiping and ways of uh, celebrating that are not the truth, that are not based on uh, the Word of God. And then a missionary comes and presents the Word of God and and, and draws attention to um, who God is, the true God. And God blesses it, and he, and he answers prayer, and people begin to recognize who God is. So, as I was thinking about that, uh, there were some correlations there with this story. You have this, this location in Israel, which is Mount Carmel. And uh, I've never been there. I've just looked at maps and stuff, and I'm told that it's 
a, a very, very prominent mountain in the northern part, kind of dividing the Mediterranean Sea from the Sea of Galilee. So on one side of the mountain, it almost comes all right down to the, the sea of the Mediterranean Sea on that side. And then on the other side, you have the Valley of Jezreel or the Valley of um, what we call the, uh, the, the Valley of Prophecy, you know, where the final battle is going to be held there. And then beyond the valley, then you have on over to the Sea of Galilee. So this place has been an important place. It's, it's one of the, what they call the high places. And so worship has been conducted in this place for many centuries, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. And so it wasn't surprising that um, the prophets of Baal would want to meet there to have this showdown. And I don't know if it was or wasn't surprising that Elijah chose it or agreed there. And so as they, the prophets of Baal spent all their time and all their energy calling on their gods and their gods couldn't respond. And then you come to this point where Elijah takes, um, repairs the altar of the Lord. And that's, that was kind of the, uh, I had a kind of a circuitous path to come to this point in my study. But at, at that point, I was thinking about um, the, the law whenever God spoke to Abraham, and Abraham went and built altars. Um, the Lord had made a, 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 an order, an ordinance, that you, and when you build an altar, you build it out of natural stone, one that hasn't had any tools on it. You know, it's not ornate, and it's not, um, uh, um, <coughs> What do you call it? It doesn't have decorations. It doesn't have anything distracting on it. Of course, now, by contrast, whenever he had them um, construct the, the tabernacle and the temple, he had very specific design elements that they were supposed to incorporate into the building of the altar. So when we're thinking about the worship of God, and compared to the worship of other, of other gods or idols. Elijah here um, repaired the, the altar. And I, I have read it back and forth over it several times. And was trying to see, are, the, are there two altars there? Is one an altar to Baal and the other an altar to God? Or had the, the, had the Baal prophets co-opted? the altar of God. And after jumping up and down on it for hours and hours, it had fallen into disrepair. And so Elijah takes 12 stones, natural stones, um, and he repairs it very symbolically, representing the 12 tribes of Israel, um, and calls, you know, and uh, actually um, acknowledges that when Jacob's was, name was cha changed to Israel. So this altar was symbolic even in that respect as far as what had occurred there. That moment when God met with him and changed his name from Jacob to Israel. So that was one of the thoughts that I, I, I was thinking about is that when we go in missions and we arrive and we start preaching about this God we don't we're not starting with God from the very beginning that's not the first experience with God just as when um, Elijah arrived on Mount Carmel that wasn't the first time 
that God had showed up on Mount Carmel. Rather, what is happening is that we are bringing people back to God who had at one time known him. And so it doesn't matter where you go in the world and who you bring the gospel to, um, at some point in the past, at some point in history, there was a knowledge of God among every people, among every group, in every language. And it was by a process of willful ignorance, and we, we could read the whole chapter there in Romans chapter 1, how he, how he kind of documents the way people move away from the knowledge of God to an ignorance through willful ig ignoring of who God is and what he has done. And so Elijah um, performed this, this ministry, and he brought again and reestablished and repaired and rebuilt the altar of God and brought them back to this moment um, in which God revealed himself again. The same God, if, if we wanted to trace it, that... Um, now, I'm following the notes of, of Bullinger here, but I, I, I think he's right that um, Adam and Eve, after they had fallen and they were sent out of the, of the garden... The garden was, was protected and kept by an angel with a fiery sword. And then we have the story of Cain and Abel bringing sacrifices. Um, and how did they know which one was accepted and which one was not? And um, Bullinger believes that it, it was because that fire fell on one and not on the other. When you have the establishment of the tabernacle and, you, and they, they did all the preparation and they, they built it to design just as God had cre told them to and just as God had given, uh, revealed the, the, the blueprint to Moses and at that moment of dedication, Moses didn't light a match to start the fire. He, everything was prepared. Everything was sanctified. Everything was anointed. Everything was in order. But they waited, and God responded and sent fire upon the altar. And therefore, because God sent fire upon that altar, their instruction was never let the fire go out. You see, because that, that was God's fire. That wasn't man's fire. Never let it go out. And so they kept that fire burning from day to day and week to week and month to month. And then uh, on over, when um, they said that the, the lamps in, in, the, um, in, the inner, in the inner sanctuary would burn low, if they went out, then they would take fire from the altar to relight them. They would take fire from the altar to burn the incense on the, on, the ho on the holiest of all, right before the curtain and the holiest of all. And so the, the, the true worship of God was denoted by the fact that God answered by fire. So this wasn't a one-off experience, I think, for Elijah here. But this was rather him reasserting the worship of God as it had been set out from the beginning. And so that's important. If we are to be mission-minded and if we are um, going into a missionary situation, remember that... God has already um, 
established himself. Um, Brother Johnny actually was mentioning it, I think, Sunday morning. Um, whenever Paul went to talk to the heathen and went to talk to the Greeks, for example, in Acts chapter 17, where did he go? He went back to the Creator, right? He showed the Greeks that God was there already from the beginning. I'm not bringing in some new religion. I'm not bringing in some new God newly sprung up. But this is the God who created all things from the beginning. And so um, we see the same thing here with Elijah. So Elijah, after this happened and, and God responded and God um, broke the dearth that had been over there and broke the, the, the lack of rain and, and brought rain. And, and then we know that um, Elijah had caught and killed the prophets of Baal. And then he received word there in the beginning of chapter 19 from Jezebel that his life was no more worth than any of those um, Baalite prophets that he would also um, face death just as they had. And so I'm going to pick up here down um, in verse 3, chapter 19, verse 3. It says, And when he saw that, well, I'll start in verse 1. Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, and withal how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them, by tomorrow about this time. So she threatened him by the gods. Right? And he had just proven that the gods have no power. And yet here he is um, fearing because of, of this, um, this oath that she made to the gods. Verse 3. And when he saw that, he arose and went for his life, came to Beersheba, which belongeth to Judah, and left his servant there. And he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, and came and sat down under a juniper tree, and he requested for himself that he might die, and said, It is enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my father's. You have to realize that this is at the very end of Elijah's ministry. It's at the very end of Elijah's life. He had had a long life. He had had a long ministry. And this was the last great manifestation of his life and ministry. And he was tired. And he was done, pretty much. He's like, okay, this is it. This is enough. Let's, um, this, this is as far as I can go. He says, I'm no better than my father's. In other words, why should I live more than 70 or 80 years old? Um... And as he lay and slept under a juniper tree, behold, then an angel touched him and said unto him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was a cake baking on the coals and a cruise of water at his head. And he did eat and drink and laid him down again. And the angel of the Lord came again the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for thee. And he arose and did eat and drink and went in the strength of that meat forty days and forty nights unto Horeb, the mount of God. And he came thither unto a cave and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said unto him, What doest thou here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, Slain thy prophets with the sword, and I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And he said, Go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind rent the mountains and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake of fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. 
And it was so when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entering in of the cave. And behold, there came a voice unto him and said, What doest thou here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, because the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left. And they seek my life to take it away. And the Lord said unto him, Go, return on thy way to the wilderness of Damascus. When thou comest, anoint Hazael to be king over Syria. And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, shalt thou anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Abel-Mehulah, shalt thou anoint to be prophet in thy room. And it shall come to pass that him that escapeth the sword of Hazael shall Jehu slay. Him that escapeth the sword of Jehu shall Elijah slay. Verse 18. Yet I have left me 7,000 in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which has not kissed him. So he departed thence. So Elijah came to understand um, at this moment, as his ministry was mostly over, that God is there and that God is able. God is there and God is able. God wasn't in the show necessarily, even though he could be. He was in the fire on the Mount Carmel, but he wasn't in the fire on Mount Horeb. He had been in the fire before whenever he met with Moses on Mount Horeb. And Moses saw the burning bush. But this particular fire, God wasn't in it. God came in a still, small voice. The second thing I see here is that it wasn't just for Elijah. It was for Elijah. And, and God's, God was speaking to Elijah. But God was speaking to many people at the same time. Even people that Elijah did not know who they were. He said 7,000 here. We know for a fact, Elijah knew for a fact, right before this incident, that as he was coming out of hiding and coming to find um, Ahab, Ahab's servant came across him. And we know in the very court of Ahab that he had mutiny servants who were maintaining true to the Lord, who had hidden prophets of the Lord in a cave and fed them. So there was at least 50 prophets in a cave that Elijah knew about. There was, in the very, in the very place, in the very cave, um, where the um, idolatry was most rampant, in the court of Ahab, there were still people who would not give in would not give up, and were, were, um, were believing in the Lord. So it's not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. Now that's an interesting statement. Um, that's, I, I've quoted it before. That's what the Lord told to Zerubbabel there in Zechariah chapter 4. Um, about God's process. God is not in... Um, to power plays and power maneuvers necessarily. He can. He has authority over all powers and he sets them up and takes them down as he chooses. And yet, he says, in the mouth of babes and sucklings thou hast perfected praise. 
Now it said a man a little lower than the angels and had crowned them with honor and glory. So God is not limited in the ways that he has to manifest himself. And he's not limited by me and he's not limited by you. And he's not limited by Elijah. And so that brings me to the third link in this chain, which is Elijah was just that. He was a link in a chain. He passed the truth of God during a very, very difficult time, no doubt, no doubt. He had received it. He maintained it pure and steadfast before the Lord. He performed the duties of prophet um, faithfully all his life, even to the very end. And he had this great finale there on top of Mount Carmel. And then his work wasn't done until he passed it on to the prophet Elijah, Elisha. And so the same is true for us. Each one of us has a responsibility to pass on. We don't have to do everything, but we do have to ensure that we have passed it on to one other person at, at, at the least. We are each links in a chain. You think about Abraham. There was one, there was one link between Abraham and the promise, and that one link was Isaac. Right? He had only one son. In Isaac shall thy seed be called. And if if we we could almost boil all of Abraham's faithfulness down to that one thing in bringing forth Isaac. And Isaac being um, the son of promise. And Isaac being um, where his faith was manifest in believing God and in following God. All the other promises about Abraham blessing the nations of the earth and uh, the peoples of the earth through his family all came down to this one, Isaac. One link, and yet that one link did not fail. So whenever he comes to offering Isaac there on the top of the mount, um, which was actually the temple mount, we, we find out later, where the temple was built later in, in Jerusalem. Um, Abraham wasn't, wasn't um, experimenting with a new religion. And he wasn't, um, as he was, as God had told him, he, he wasn't questioning. Now this is interesting. He wasn't questioning had God lost his mind? Um, we find out from uh, Hebrews that Abraham believed in a particular kind of God, a God who, who was pro-life, a God who gave life. And so Abraham believed that if it was necessary, he would raise Isaac up in order to fulfill his promise. That was the kind of faith that Abraham had. If it was necessary, he would raise... So it wasn't the act of killing Isaac necessarily, but the act of resurrection that was the, the focus and goal and point of Abraham's motivation in that act. And that showed his faith. The faith in a God who saves, a faith in a God who preserves, a God who gives life. And so, each one of us, uh, in the same way, we have that faith to pass on, 
Just as we have received life, life in the spirit, life full, um, life to the uttermost, life, eternal life, so we can pass that on to others. And, and that kind of brings me to, in, to my conclusion here. And I was thinking about this um, as far as my personal testimony. Um, I had many influences in my life that um, were vital, and I, I praise God for that. It's, it's hard to point to one person that said, this person led me to the Lord. But I can think of um, a Sunday school teacher of mine um, whenever I was seven years old, going on eight. His name was uh, Joe Brogel. And I remember him, there was, he had the um, elementary Sunday school boys. And there was three of us. And I remember him squatting there in front of that pew. We, we had a, a, little back, a little pew in a back room. And that was our Sunday school room. And he would squat there on eye level. And he would um, teach us out of the book of Romans. And Romans 10 and 9. Um, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thy heart that he has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Um, and so Joe Brogel taught me that. And then my uncle Michael was preaching um, and preaching through the book of Psalms. And so Psalm 27, when, when the Lord said, seek ye my face, my heart said, thy face, Lord, will I seek. And, and all these things came together and passed to me. And then um, I had the privilege of passing them on and, and my brother Peter says that I was the influence that brought him to the Lord when he was about eight or nine. I don't uh, remember. I can, I can see it in my mind, but I can't remember exactly how old I was. And then Peter has been instrumental in, in, in passing the, the gospel on to several. I, I was thinking of a, a young man in, in Mozambique that he spent a lot of time with named Carlos, but many, many, many others. The point is that you have this links in a chain and they may not um, surface or be aware or, or, or nobody else may know it, but yet it's there and it's ongoing. And that's why God has given life and God is the God of life and he has created this spiritual um, reproduction, if you will, that that is just the image of him it is the the stamp of him and in his work and it continues on from generation to generation to generation and it is in christ christ is that seed and so that brings me to my very very last thing and that was um i was thinking about um john 12. Christ quoted, he says, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. And so Christ gave up his life. And in giving up his life, he actually took it again and became the author of resurrection. And so we too... The only way in which our life is going to count is by giving it up. And then um, through dying, through dying on the cross, through dying with him, through reckoning ourselves dead indeed with him, then alive unto God. And through, through him to live on and to be sharers and conveyors of eternal life. So, may the Lord add his blessing to these things.